This show is dedicated to helping you strengthen your family tree and live financially free. Welcome to the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, everybody. This is Andy Hill, and today we're talking about developing a side hustle, something outside of our full-time jobs that gives us more income and potentially more happiness. To inspire us to think outside of the walls of our nine to five, I've invited Nick Loper on the show today. Nick is the host of the Side Hustle Show, and he writes for the massively popular Side Hustle Nation blog. His expert advice has been featured in well-known publications like Forbes, CNBC, and Entrepreneur. When he's not helping people work for themselves and have a better quality life, he's spending time with his wife and two small kids. Welcome to the show, Nick. Well, thank you for having me. I don't know if I go massively popular, but uh, working on it. <laughs> Works for me, man. <laughs> so I understand that you used to work in the corporate world. What, what led you to uh, develop your first side hustle? Um, optimistically, was looking for a way out. Um, yeah. I didn't know at the time if that was going to be feasible, but it became evident really early on. Just, it was hard to imagine the next 30 years of like, this is, this is what I do. And like, I, you know, just had no desire to climb the ladder at that company. Um, what did you do? Uh, so I was, um, in the car business. So I was working for Ford as, um, as a field rep, essentially on the service and parts side of their business. So um, drive around to their dealers and try and try and help them take better care of their customers and sell more Ford parts. Interesting. And that just was not doing it for you. Car business is a fascinating business. I, you know, learned, uh, learned a ton. Cause some of these dealers, you know, had their, you know, uh, franchise charters signed by Henry Ford. They've been in business for generations wow. and, um, you know, the front end, the back end, like the sales side, the service side, you know, how to market, how to sell, like, you know, there's no, there's no better place to learn than at a car dealership, but it it's such an old, it was such an old fashioned company. It just wasn't a great, uh, cultural fit. Sure. Yeah. And the, um, the hours and things like that, that wasn't a, a personal fit for you either. Yeah. The hours weren't horrible, but it was just, um, I don't know. Like I was always excited to, to try and do my own thing. Like I always had that in the back of my mind. Just wasn't really sure when I took the job. Okay. What was that uh, going to be? Hmm. So what was the first inkling of an idea that you had that got you inspired outside of the uh, the Ford gig? So the first real side hustle was a footwear comparison shopping site. So this is, you know, dating myself in internet years uh, a little bit. Comparison shopping is not what it once was. Mm -hmm. But the, the premise of the site was you could um, go online. It would tell you where you could find, you know, the best price on your next pair of shoes. And when you did that, I'd earn a commission from Zappos or Amazon or some of these other footwear retailers uh, for referring that customer to them. Awesome. And that uh, that turned out to be a, a good side hustle for you? Enough for you to leave your it, position? That was, uh, that was it. That was the vehicle that let me quit my job. It was kind of three years of nights and weekends building it up to that point where I felt comfortable giving my uh, notice at work. And uh, that business had had a good run. That's incredible. So where did you get the savvy to build a website that ha would have some comparison engine? And I mean, how, how did you do all that? Uh, hired people. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, I, the, I got into footwear actually through an internship at college. And like I say, I got into footwear, not like I'm some like sneakerhead or anything like that. <laughs> um, but I was working for this uh, company in Seattle that was like a brick and mortar shoe store. And back in the day, they had this like wild and crazy idea to put some of their inventory online. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I came on board, it was, you know, that part of the business had obviously grown um, much faster than their brick and mortar outfit. Um, so I was brought on and that was my first exposure to affiliate marketing and SEO and e-commerce and all that stuff. And so it was really, really valuable. It's kind of what set me down uh, the path today. That's great. So when you started developing this idea or you know, your thoughts around the side hustle, was it always in your brain, this is going to be the thing that launches me out of my, my job with Ford or just something to get my mind churning and do something outside of work? I mean, that, that was the hope that it could be uh, a full-time thing. And when I, when I quit, even, even after you have this track record of earnings history, it's still like a scary 
thing to say, like, can I really cut my own paycheck? I, I was out to dinner with my boss. It still took me like a couple beers to kind of get up the nerve to be like, you know, I mean, I'm out of here because <laughs> he, he knew about the shoe business. And at that time, like the design of the site was really awful. And he, he probably had no idea, like, OK, that's great. You know, whatever you do your thing, you know, in the evenings, that's fine. He's like, oh, OK. And it was just like this huge burden off my shoulders. Like it felt so good to to make that leap. And of course, you know, since then, it's been the entrepreneurial roller coaster. But it was it was really rewarding to to be in a position to do that. And that was a time when the economy was kind of tanking. And so it was even even more beneficial to have that to fall back on. Wow. So do you still have the the site today or did that launch into something else? Um, I don't have it anymore. It kind of died a, a slow and painful death uh, a few years ago. <laughs> so, um, but it's similar, like, you know, th during the time I was running it, started a half a dozen other projects, you know, most of which flopped, as I think is the, the nature of online business, but a couple are still around. And one of those little side projects was the Side Hustle Show podcast and the Side Hustle Nation blog. So, you know, as a little part-time thing, like, hey, we'll start this out, see where it goes. And within a year and a half or so, that was really the main focus for me. Now, was was your reason for doing that, um, obviously, preservation, because we're talking about, you know, keeping keeping the business as afloat, but also, did you have in, in your mind just sort of income diversification? So you had different, you know, I guess, legs to your stool. Were you thinking of it in that fashion? Yeah, absolutely. The diversification piece kind of hit home um, in, in a pretty painful way. Actually, my first day of self-employment. So I, you know, like I said, I was out to dinner with my boss, they give him my two weeks notice. And then like, uh, you know, I have visions of the four hour work week as I sit down like on my laptop the first day of, you know, of retirement. And it, it does not go well. Like that first day, like the server decides to crash. Um, Google, uh, of course, chooses that time to like crawl the site for their advertising uh, quality guidelines or something. So they shut down the whole ad account. Like this site doesn't even load. Oh. And then when it comes back online, now that's like raised some red flag in their system. Like, this is just a crappy affiliate site. You know, the sole purpose of your site is to drive traffic to other sites. Mm. Like Google, look in the mirror. You know, <laughs> but it was just, it was uh, a really, really stressful and frustrating experience trying to get, get back in their good graces. I thought I was uh, diversified, right? Because I had, you know, 30 or 40 different advertisers on the site. But if you peel it back one layer, you know, 80% of my traffic was coming from one source, was coming from those uh, Google ads. So it was really a painful uh, lesson to, to diversify. But to that end, I guess, you know, advice for side hustlers would be to simplify first and diversify second. So if I hadn't had that one thing up and running and paying the bills, I wouldn't have really been in a position to diversify later. So you said you had some folks helping you to build the site or, you know, help you create the engine. Did you, how did you, how did you source that capital? Did you just fund it sol solely from your, your full-time gig that you had with Ford or did you borrow? How, how did that all work? Uh, a couple of different sources. So one way to look at it is like, yeah, your employer is kind of like your silent partner, your silent venture capitalist, you know, in here where they can bankroll that things. I actually had a, uh, a rental property in, uh, in college, kind of like the tail end of college. And after that, that ended up cashing out just kind of before the the real estate bust that was a little bit of windfall uh, of cash to put some seed money into into this thing. Okay, cool. So now you're talking about the Side Hustle Show and your, your blog, Side Hustle Nation. It sounds like these things have worked out for you pretty well lately. So uh, what sort of success have you had with the, with those two platforms? Yeah, it's like a five-year uh, overnight success. <laughs> um, no, they've been. It's been really, really life-changing, honestly, to to do the podcast and again started with just a, a fifty-dollar mic in the living room and, and just started with my own network and tried to spider out from there. Who should I talk to? Hey, who else do you know? And it's turned into this this whole thing, and you know, into this kind of nationwide community, really worldwide community. We've been able to meet listeners in. Japan and Europe and Mexico and all over the place. That's cool. Yeah, I just joined your Facebook group, and I think the number was almost 20,000 uh, members. Is that about right? Uh, probably 10 or 11. Oh, um, okay. 
I'll, I'll assign you a member number later. I don't think we're quite at twenty. Yet. <laughs> okay, cool. In, in the tens of thousands, that's uh, that's that's pretty that's pretty exciting. So you've got a great reach, and you're able to get some great revenue from both the podcast and the blog. So, and and enough to you know take care of your livelihood, right? Yes, it's been um, yeah, I've been very grateful to be able to work from home and have a really flexible uh, schedule in in doing that stuff because. Yeah, kids get sick and the schools get closed or whatever. And it's just, uh, it's nice to not have to ask anybody else for the time off. That's great. How old are your kids? Uh, Three, uh, actually next week, turning three and uh, nine months. That's incredible. Excellent. And then does your wife work outside of the home or does she, does she work uh, with you as well? She does. She's a mechanical engineer by day and uh, a photographer by uh, nights and weekends. That's her side hustle. That's great. Very cool. So you guys are both side hustling your way into full time things and also keeping the side hustle. That's great. So let, let's give some advice to people out there that are looking to develop their side hustle. Um, you know, we talked about some of the reasons that maybe worked out for you or why you wanted to do your side hustle. What are some of the top reasons that you've heard from either people you've spoken to or other success stories for people to start a side hustle? What's a, what's a reason for somebody to consider it? Um, so top reasons to consider the, the consideration that draws most people to it is the extra income uh, factor, which, you know, I'm not going to fault anybody for that. Making extra money never goes out of style. Um, but beyond that, there are a couple of things that I think are really important to, to think about. Number one is to build skills. Um, so if you were to look to look at my resume today, you know, the skills that I have on there look nothing like the skills, uh, that I had coming out of college. Um, so it's, you know, been a tremendous learning experience um, outside of any sort of formal education. Um, and the second piece of that is just building uh, confidence and security. I want to say it's a Chris Gillibo quote that's like, your competence is your security. What value can you provide to the world? What skills do you have uh, that uh, that can pay the bills, whether for yourself or for, you know, what problems can you solve for other people? Um, and on the lines of the, the confidence building thing, so I mentioned my wife was doing uh, photography on the side. Um, we went through a uh, a less than intelligent uh, real estate decision, and it was a huge burden on our on our relationship. Just like it was just it's a stressful situation uh, through and through. And one of the things that started to kind of be a light at the end of the tunnel was you know something else to focus on. And hey, I have value outside of what it says on my business card, outside of what it says on uh, my paycheck. And so it was really, really empowering to uh, to make those first side dollars. That's incredible. That's incredible, yeah. Now there's a lot of people that um, I've had an opportunity to talk to through this podcast that are, you know, they're just looking to clobber the last of their student loans or or you know that credit card debt that they have. A side hustle could be a great avenue for that. Is that right? Yeah, you can cut if you think about in terms of debt. If you try to think about in terms of you know your your fire number, right? You can cut years off your life if it's just uh, not off your life, but off of your working life, out of your working career with just you know five hundred thousand bucks a month uh, extra. That's cool. Well, let's let's inspire some people with some ideas. Then I know there are hundreds of side hustles. I actually read your your blog article about the ninety nine <laughs> ideas, which I which I loved. But can you give us a few examples of some successful side hustles that you've seen um, out there? Uh, well, let's go through through maybe we'll go through a couple a couple uh, frameworks and and maybe we'll kind of start at start at the bottom and, and work our way up. So where a lot of people start is with the the sharing economy, the gig economy. These are the, the Lyft drivers of the world, the Airbnb hosts of the world, the DoorDash delivery people of the world, the uh, Rover.com uh, pet sitting hosts of the world, right? Like these platforms make it really easy to get started and have almost no barrier uh, to entry for better or worse. Um, and so I think a lot of people get started there and it, and it can be addicting. My uh, Uber driver in Chicago was like, when, uh, when I want to make money, I turn on the app. It's like, boom, you know, that's how, that's how it works. Um, the disadvantage to platforms like that, I mean, the big advantage is like, Hey, there's a, there's a big audience of buyers on the other side. Um, so you don't have to market yourself necessarily. It's just, you know, I mean, there's some, some gentle nudges you might want to give the the algorithm on certain platforms that are more review based, um, 
but there's a huge audience of buyers that you can tap into. Mm-hmm. Uh, the downside with a lot of those that are, you know, driven by your input, but driven by your hourly input is, you know, if it's a skill like driving, it's not that rare of a skill. So there's a, nat- a natural downward pressure on, um, on how much you can earn there. Um, where I see people taking that, um, you know, to uh, to a higher level is you know freelancing with your specific skills. I'm going to start uh, a freelance writing business, a freelance web design business, a freelance, you know, whatever it is. Um, the the downside to that, of course, is you're still trading time for money. And so, where I've seen some interesting people do um, you know, remove themselves from that operation, probably one of the most inspiring ones. Uh, I'll give a couple. Um, Russ Perry from uh, designpickle.com. It offers unlimited graphic design service for, you know, a flat monthly fee. Russ told me I sucked at design. So it was never about him doing the work, but it was just him kind of playing matchmaker between businesses that could use design help and his team that was largely in the Philippines and I believe still is. Um, but in just a few years, he'd grown this to like, you know, a multiple hundred thousand dollar a year or hundred thousand dollar a month uh, operation. Wow. And had you know, built the support systems uh, to grow it there. The other one, kind of a less online example, was just a simple house cleaning business. Um, a guy who was actually still in college in the D.C. area started thinkmaids.com. And he was like, I was going through Yelp and I was reading the reviews for these cleaning services. Nobody was complaining about the cleaning. Like the technical product they were offering was fine. But the complaints were like, they didn't call me back. I didn't know that when they were going to come, uh, you know, it took forever to get a quote. He's like, I could do that stuff and I could find <laughs> people to do the cleaning. And so when we talked, you know, two years into his business, he was doing 60 grand a month, you know, cleaning people's houses without ever having done, you know, the, the cleaning himself, you know, vacuuming or sweeping himself. So that was a really interesting example of like a, you know, it's a service business. It's a freelancing business, but it's just, you know, not making it dependent on your own uh, on your own input. I love it. So in, instead of cleaning the houses, you find the people to clean the houses. That's how you can really scale. That's incredible. Yeah, remove remove yourself. So that's kind of one place that people start. Kind of like this offering, uh, you know. So gig economy stuff, uh, you know, provide a service. The next uh, level would be to sell a product, mm-hmm. and that could be you know physical product or a digital product. On the physical product side. Uh, the the person I always refer people to is uh, the flea market flipper. I think it's flea market flipper dot com. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rob Stevenson. Did you meet this guy at FinCon? No, 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 no. I've heard about him though. Yeah. Yeah. Him and his wife. They are awesome, and they are just professional money multipliers. They're like deal hounds on trying to find stuff they think is undervalued and turning it around for sometimes crazy profits. He <laughs> like he seems to have a specialty. I don't know if he'll admit that because he'll just say, I look just for random stuff. Um, but in, in his stories to me, it seems like he's he's really focusing on, you know, big, bulky, random one off products like a, he told me about a concrete polisher, like an industrial thing. I don't even know what that is. Um, <laughs> a uh, like a, a parking lot surveillance like a, like a house, essentially, like an air-conditioned box uh-huh. that, you know, you used to, like, monitor uh, parking lots on stilts or something, flipped it for, like, a 20 grand profit in a month. It's like, <laughs> st- man, it doesn't take many deals to uh, to make a pretty good living doing that. Wow. Um, so I like that stuff. And then, of course, there's a million different models, uh, you know, to go wholesale on Amazon, private label on Amazon, clearance arbitrage on Amazon and eBay and all this stuff. Um, and then... Maybe the fourth tier, and this is kind of the tier that you or I are involved in, and that's like the, you know, online authority business. I'm going to build something around my niche or my expertise, and I'm going to sell a digital product. I'm going to sell my audience's attention in the form of advertising or affiliate products. Um, And that's an inspiring one to me, because it's also scalable, right? It's a one, a one-to-many broadcast medium through blogging, podcasting, YouTube, and um, I've seen some people putting up some pretty crazy numbers on that stuff. I talked to a guy recently who was selling uh, a course on microgreens farming, which I had never heard of before talking to him, but he was like, "Oh, it's super nutrient dense, and it's like a seven-day turnaround time." You know, I had all these reasons like why it was awesome. 
but he was doing like 40, 50 grand a month worth of this course on selling microgreens because he had established himself as like the guy to to go to learn about it. That's incredible. Yeah, we we had uh, Michelle Schroeder Gardner on the show, I think, last year. I mean, folks like that that have, that have been able to make millions uh, per year on theirs. I mean, obviously, it's a hyperbole example, but she's doing an incredible job and inspiring a lot of people in the same fashion. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of number four as well. <laughs> yep. So, uh, you know, there's some people listening right now and say, hey, this this sounds really inspiring. I would love to make some more money to pay off some debt or just grow a business that I could be proud of. But they're thinking, I don't have enough time to do that. I, wh- <laughs> where can people find the time or or, or to make, make time to actually make this happen? Make time is the key, is uh-huh. the key phrase there. Um, you're probably not likely to find the time. It's, uh, you know, carving it out, making it a priority. And we're kind of going through a, a season, at least in our house, where that time is pretty tight. Uh, so it's, you know, trying to be open, you know, with your partner and be like, look, this is something that's really important to me. Um, you know, what's the, what's the trade off? Like, hey, you want to go do this photo shoot? Hey, you want to go to this dance class? Like, okay. And you don't, you don't want to make it really a tit for tat, but it's like, okay, but you know, I'm going to, in exchange, I'm going to want some time to, to focus on this. And there's an understanding there. Um, it's, we tried to, um, actually talked about this on the house of Fi uh, podcast, you know, how do you balance, you know, the, the family, the job and the side business, you know, without the guarantee that the side business is ever going to see any results. Like that's the big mm-hmm. uh, wild card in all of this. It's like, how do you justify investing time in it when when you don't know? It's like this big speculative uh, venture. And there are ways to make it less speculative, but uh, that's something that came up. And um, Wendy and Tamika had some interesting ideas on that, on, well, you know, if your kids are older, could you involve them? Could you use that um, as an opportunity to teach them entrepreneurship? So I thought that was um, some good ways um, around that to kind of balance that. It's like, here's a little dose of entrepreneurial homeschool here uh, to see to see where that goes. No, I like that a lot. That, that makes a lot of sense. And obviously, you know, you, you made the point right away. Just make make the time. So it's it's prioritizing. And especially if you're married, it's having those conversations. Because I've I've done it on my side, Nick. I don't know if you have, where I just like sort of go ahead and do something without really talking to my spouse about it. And that's usually when we end up, you know, getting to some arguments about, hey, you know, uh, this, this side hustle or your job or even just time with kids or these activities we signed up for kids. It's just not all working. We need to figure out a way to carve out the schedule and align our priorities to it, right? So if our priorities are to spend more time with the family, to take care of our health, to grow our businesses, we got to we gotta figure out a way to line those up and then just eliminate those things that aren't really adding towards those goals. So I know you're dealing with that a lot with a three-year-old and a, you know less than one-year-old in your house. So that's, uh, that's something that's probably fresh on, on your mind right now. Yeah, he's like, is it a work day for you, Daddy? Yeah, it's a work day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. How, how is that? You know, I mean, with you running your business from home, how do you maintain that separation of getting your work done and, and being dad? It's well, it, one thing that helps is, you know, sending him off to preschool, setting him off to daycare. And so having a, a pretty good block of time during the day. And usually that helps me be able to shut off at night and say, okay, I you know, I had my I had my time and now it's now it's family time. If if it was in the situation where it's like the evenings were the only I mean, it would really realistically, it would just be, you know, nine to 11, like after they go to bed or it would be, you know, five to six before they got up. Um, if we, <laughs> you know, seasons like sometimes it's like, you know, prioritize your sleep, prioritize your help or your health first um, and then. Uh, you can work on the uh, and work on the business stuff because if you're not taking care of yourself, like you're not going to be performing optimally in any area of of your life. But it's it's definitely a challenge. I, I I don't know if you found this to be true, but like for me, I think it's made me less. You know, having kids has made me less productive in that there's always there's, there's never enough hours. Like there's no risk of being bored. There's always going to be more to do. It's like uh, you know, you're never going to be done. Um, but it's made me more effective and more intentional with the time that I do have. It's like, okay, 
you know, give me give me an hour and a half nap time. And it's like, boom, let's go. Like I can I'm edit the show. <laughs> I'm going to write this, you, you know, and it's like, you know exactly what you have to do because you're like, all right, it's go time. Right. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, the opportunity for procrastination goes away because you're like, all right, right. I got this time and I know I'm not going to get it back. So, <laughs> so, okay. So you're running your side hustle show and the blog and, you know, you're feeling pretty good with where, where you are in your life right now. What, what what financial or, or personal goals do you have that are exciting you? Obviously, you know, a lot of people talk about, hey, I've, I want to develop my side hustle in a way where I can do that as my full-time thing. You're doing that now. So what, what's exciting you now for the future? What's exciting? Obviously, I mean, the opportunity to to travel, the opportunity to potentially retire my wife, if she would like that. Um, she's, I mean, I guess she could. But she's just like, you know, not ready to not ready to do that. You know, still I've still got some some life to give here to the to the career there. Um, it's it, what's really most interesting is the stories that come out of doing the show. And now people a lot of times just send them to me where it's like, hey, have you heard about this? Or, hey, you ought to check out this guy, what he's doing. And, you know, those are really inspiring to me to say, hey, there's. I, I don't know. I may be naively worried about running out of people to talk. Like, I'm going to do a weekly show. Am I going to run out of people to talk to? And it's like, well, there are people doing daily shows and they don't run out of people to talk to. <laughs> um, you know, are there still new side? There's always new side hustles. You know, there's a million creative ways to get it done. So that's really inspiring. I'm trying to think of big financial goals. Um, I don't know. I guess I... I'm actually working this week on kind of a, a household budget, which we've been really blessed to not really, we've always had a, a general idea of what's coming in and what's going out, but to be like, okay, what, what's the surplus? What's our personal profitability these days? And like, okay, what can we do with that surplus, you know, to be more intentional about investing, be more intentional about giving, um, and see where, see where that goes. So I'm trying to put those numbers together this week. That's excellent. Well, it's a great place to start and especially you doing it with your spouse. That's a, especially with a young family. That's, that's awesome. So, so Nick, um, there's somebody listening right now and they're like, okay, I'm, I'm interested in this. I, I can carve out a little bit of time. I'll make this maybe a priority if I can, you know, move things around and, uh, you know, say no to some stuff that's not really priority for me. Where's the best place for them to start uh, once they've blocked off that time? How do they how do they decide where to go with regard to their side hustle? I think you start with what you're excited about. Um, either you know what excites you about your job or what excites you outside of your job. Um, bonus points if somebody has paid you for that in the past, and if and if not, there's like a little bit more validation that has to happen. I mean, if you're you know just at the very beginning, you're looking for some ideas, some inspiration. Uh, Andy mentioned the the monster list post. So that's side hustle slash ideas. But I maybe, maybe I flip it around and say like, okay, what, you know, when you were lucky to start, you know, this side project, like what got you off the sidelines? Oh, for me, honestly, I was looking for, um, an opportunity to learn from people, uh, to share some knowledge that I had and, also just to help. I, I, I like helping people. And then as I was listening to podcasts, I got inspired by a lot of people who were doing that in that same fashion. So I said, well, I've got something to say. I'd like to learn from people. I could do it in an interview format. And in the beginning, I didn't really think too much about the revenue side of things. I just wanted to do something that was creative, that made me sort of flex my entrepreneurial creative muscle. Yeah. And then yeah, I realized, yeah. wow, I can, I can make a little bit of money doing this. I'm not you know making crazy money or anything like that, but I do like the extra money that's coming in, and I love all the great people that I'm able to talk to. Well, you are a very natural host behind the mic, and <laughs> thank you. That's um, no, you sound you sound great. Like I don't know if you had a background in radio or anything, but you know you sound very. I mean, I mean, to your point on on skills beforehand, right? So <laughs> I I do present at my job, so okay. I, I do have the background in that. So you don't want to like like you're saying, you don't want to just go into something that you don't have a little bit of marketable skills on, right? I mean, because you could really like something as a hobby, but if you don't have any marketable skills at it, then you might not be a successful side hustle. Is that what you're saying? Um, you can always learn those skills, but true. Yeah. It, it could be uh, a harder road to start. Or hire people uh, like you did. Right. Like if I was trying to code that website myself, like, you know, it, it would still not be launched. Yeah. Um, 
I think in the tech today it would make it a lot easier to build. I mean, this is kind of pre WordPress, pre a lot of the off the shelf uh, services that you could use. So it was all custom. And uh, I think, I guess I think of investments as a, as a percentage of net worth. Mm -hmm. And at that time it was a 10 grand total development cost and had done some validation with like some Google text ads and stuff to say, okay, people are buying, but it's still a little bit of a risk to to plunk down that cash. And of course, there's, you know, with any software project, there's milestones, right? So it's a couple grand up front and then you hit this milestone and then you go on to the next thing. But as a percentage of net worth, like there was a pretty big bet at that time. It was a pretty big investment to make where, you know, we kind of look at stuff now and we're, you know, sweating over these, you know, decisions over like, well, what, what bike should we get our kid? What if he doesn't like it? <laughs> and you're like, oh, you know, that's like a, you know, a tiny sliver of the pie. Like if it doesn't work, like you just, you sell it on Craigslist. Like it's not going to, it doesn't matter, you know? And so we, we sweat over this small stuff. And so reframing it as like, okay, um, it, what was, I forget even where I heard this, but it's like, you know, make 5% bets. Cause it's like, you could probably live on 95% uh, of the calories that you're currently consuming. You could probably live on 95% of the oxygen you're currently consuming. Like you probably live on 95% of the sleep that you're currently uh, getting. And it's like, okay, but that 5% has the chance to leverage, you know, has still a chance to upscale, you know, if you manage the downside risk into something uh, a lot bigger. I like that. I like that. Make 5% bets. That's cool. <laughs> Okay, well, so um, Nick, as you were starting this journey and saying, "Hey, I'm I'm thinking of doing something new, outside of my full time job," was there a book or anything that you were starting to read at that that point where you said, "Wow, this is really motivational to me to start my first side hustle"? Now, back in the day, my uh, my college roommate handed me uh, "Rich Dad Poor Dad," which was really kind of formative, um, and whether or not you know, rich dad really exists and all, and all this stuff. Right. Like there's a whole, a there's a whole other controversy. <laughs> um, but the, the core concepts of that investing for cash flow, you know, buying or building assets instead of liabilities, like those were really powerful for an impressionable youth and something that I've tried to, um, tried to do and the same idea. You know, he focuses a lot on real estate, but you could consider, you know, a website as digital real estate. And it's like, here's an asset that, you know, barring any, you know, Google disasters can spin off some cash without your direct uh, input, without your direct involvement. Yeah. And I, I love, I'm not sure if it was that book or the cash flow quadrant. One of his, one of his books that he wrote was a, along the lines of what you had already said too, where you can be a, an employee or you can be a self-employed person mm -hmm. or you can own your own business and then really be the, you know, the owner of it. And I think those are different portions of the quadrant there. I totally messed it up, but along the lines of what you were saying with, Hey, are you going to, you're going to trade your time for money with, with something like Lyft, or are you going to utilize your skills and sell that? Or are you going to get a group of people, manage them and then have them do the work while you collect the cash? So yeah, absolutely. Levels. It's totally, yeah, it's absolutely climbing the, climbing the cash flow quadrant and, you know, you're starting out, you're working for money, and then hopefully eventually your money works for you, and then hopefully eventually your money works for others. I love it. I love it, man. Well, thanks so much for spending time with us today. Nick, where can people find you and learn more about how to be a side hustler? Uh, so we mentioned sidehustlenation.com slash ideas. That's a fantastic place to start. A big list of you know, uh, part-time business ideas for your uh, inspiration there. Uh, no opt-in required. And of course, would love to have you tune in uh, to the Side Hustle Show. It's over 300 episodes uh, deep. So pick and choose the, uh, the episodes that sound most interesting to you and start there. Excellent. Nick, I will put all those links in the show notes and I really appreciate you joining us today. You bet. Thanks for having me, man.